Welcome back, everyone, to the Flow Track Podcast. I'm Kevin Sully, joined by Gordon Matt. Gordon's still finishing his Thanksgiving leftovers, it appears, as we start the show. How was your how was your holiday, Gordon? It was good. It's an orange, a little mini clementine orange, which are the best kind. One of those tiny clementines. Gives you a little bit of sugar boost in the morning. Right oh, my Thanksgiving, though? Thanksgiving was great. I spent it uh, with a bunch of strangers that I did not know. But it was great. I think that's the best way to do Thanksgiving. You do it with people you don't know. Not people you know. That's that's so last year and years before. So I had a minute. Thanksgiving with a bunch of people I didn't know. And it was fine. It was good. You didn't know good. anybody? Where did you go? Well, I knew two people of the 12. I knew JoJo, who invited me. And okay. JoJo knew one person that I knew from that group. So then everyone else was a stranger to me. Gotcha. Gotcha. How many times did you get recognized? Not, not, I didn't get recognized at all. <laughs> no one said, hey, are you the strangers. guy from the NCAA cross country show? Nobody said that to you? No, unfortunately not. I haven't okay. gone. I haven't been syndicated yet. So uh, <laughs> I was just a regular guy eating turkey. That's what I was. You're in Austin though. Yes. I was in Austin. Yeah. I was in okay. Austin. Went to the Texas football game on Friday. Beat West Virginia. Uh, beat Kansas State to go five and seven. <laughs> Same as record as my Philadelphia Eagles who lost to the Giants uh, unexpectedly. But you know, it was a good sports weekend. Lots of losses to to watch from the Philadelphia side. My team lost to Minnesota in basketball, but. I am excited for the Cincinnati Bearcats in college football. They're 12 and 0. Mm. They're going to take a big dump on the college football playoff and be the first non-power 5 team to make it in the college football playoff. I think they still have to beat Houston. Yes, which is next week. But I'm Sweet cheering City. for chaos. Yeah, true. Carl Lewis, we're going to might be see him this week. We'll talk talk trash cuz I'm going to be a big Cincinnati fan cuz I want a non-power 5 to make the college football playoff. But when you really think about it, it's going to be kind of ironic because Cincinnati is going to be a power five team in like three years. So yeah, yeah. is it really a non-power five? <laughs> Same thing with TCU. They were constantly ignored. And then all of a sudden yeah. they're in the big 12. And now it's like, all right, you're not ignored no. anymore. Yeah. So. No, it'll be, yeah, it's gonna be interesting last couple of weeks. So I want, we don't normally talk about high school stuff in the show, but I saw the results from the CIF meet out in California and you posted a tweet on the flow track Twitter account. So we got to talk about the Newberry Tar- park boys. We have to talk about the Newberry park boys. There's no other way to start the show. Yeah, I know it was, a, it was a slow week in the world track and field cause it was Thanksgiving and yeah, the, the Manchester run, which is a pro road race that always attracts big names. And there's some other sprint news that we want to talk about, but we got to start here with this Newberry park boys story because what they did, at the California State Championships was ridiculous. They scored 16 points. 16 points. Their men's team goes one, two, three, four, seven at the California State meet. Their fifth guy, their sixth guy, excuse me, was ninth. Ninth. This is California. This is the biggest division. And they scored 16 points. Now you might be saying, okay, Kevin, Gordon, maybe they took advantage of a light year. Maybe competition was just down this year and Newberry Park was able to take advantage. That is entirely incorrect because the times that they ran at that state course are the number two, three, five, and 11 all time. So their fourth runner tied for the 11th fastest performance in state history. Their best runner, Colin Solomon, was two seconds back of German Fernandez's 2007 time. Legendary performance for German Fernandez. Their top two runners, Solomon and Leo Young, were ahead of a guy by the name of Nico Young, who ran 1429 in the course in 2019. And then Lex Young, if you're getting confused on Youngs, that's okay. Maybe you're new to high school cross country. Lex Young was one second behind Nico. So three of the top five performances in California history on one team. Any way you slice this, this is just preposterous to wrap your head around the level of dominance from Newberry Park. 
yeah, it's incredible. It the fact that it's all happening in the same year is incredible. The fact that it's basically just two families, it's two pairs of brothers, Colin and Aaron Solomon, and then the Lex and Leo Young twins. And it is, they are in like really rich history. I mean, Nico Young is arguably going to become an all-time great runner. He's run 13-24 as a true freshman already. He's already back-to-back All-American and cross. He didn't run as well this past year, but that's because the expectations on him already are like through the roof after finishing top five in March. But Nico Young is still fine. He's still like 20 years old or whatever. He's going to mm-hmm. have a long career. And German Fernandez is, he's like legend. He is like yeah. the yeah. epitome of legendary high school running, legendary type of young career. Now, obviously he didn't turn into a Galen Rupp and have a, a long pro career, but he did have a very good Oklahoma state career. And these three guys were all within less like six seconds from his all time mark. And it is incredible to see what's happening i put up a like you said i put up a stat they're ranked two three five and eleven and german german fernandez number one 1424 colin salmon 1426 so two seconds back leo young 1428 four seconds back then nico young in 2019 then lex young this year 1430 and there are some other names in this list like amar musa he finished top five Mm -hmm. in cross was part of the Colorado cross country run that they had there. You have Lane Worley, who he he was like he was consistent all American. He made nationals outdoors twice. He was all American in cross country twice. You have mm-hmm. Eduardo Herrera on this list, who you know he's run thirteen twenties. He's been an all American for Colorado. He's been a, a a very strong runner. He's in his final year at Colorado. But for four guys to be in this conversation all in the same team in the same year. We this is not normal. And you have more understanding of the history of California cross country than I do cuz you're from California. And so someone from like New Jersey is probably like, "Okay, cool. California, you ran for we don't how hard is that course? What does this time really mean?" blah blah blah. Like, "Okay, I never heard of Brian Daneworth of Algoria." From 1989, so should I be that impressed? Agura, apologies for the California (laughs) natives out there. Uh, But when you look at it, the fact that if you just even ignore their fourth guy, who's 11th all time, the top three guys, (laughs) Lex, Leo, and Colin, they're all within seconds of German and Nico, right? Yeah, yeah. German Fernandez went on to run an incredible fast two mile time same with nico young he ran 756 in the 3k so these three guys are on pace to have incredible outdoor track seasons which i don't think we've ever seen three guys on the same team have incredible outdoor track seasons like all time top 10 type caliber because that's where german and nico were nico had to do it in a crazy covid time but I don't know, man. It, it's going to be an incredible 2022 for those three guys and maybe even Aaron Solomon. Yeah. German, that spring, went on to go four flat in the, in the mile, or 1600, excuse me, at state, pretty much solo. And then he ran 834, pretty much solo, in the 3200. And then they did the, he did the two mile, remember, at Nike in North Carolina and ran 834. And then you go to 09, so his first year in in college, and was running with you know thirteen twenty five, so was really good as a a freshman. Obviously, right off the bat, remember that three fifty five Big Twelve mile that he basically soloed. Like Jim and Fernandez was a revelation because he came on late in his career, um, and he was on such a crazy run those couple of years. And that's really where it started. His senior year in cross country was when he really got on the map on the radar. Yeah. This is the big division in California and you know how deep California is. You just know how many people California has, you know, how deep these schools are. You hear programs like Saugus, right? Like, uh, Arcadia going back. I mean, this is, 
this is crazy. And the fact that you have those historical markers there just tells you how how good it is. You don't see in a small state, in a small division, seeing somebody do one, two, three, four is rare. Right? Like if someone did this in the lowest d- d- division at, at a local meet, you'd be like, holy, holy cow, that's, that, that's a, a level of dominance. Even in a, you know, even in those lower levels, like at state, usually there's some, someone to break up that spot. And then you go back to, you know, your, your fifth guy is seventh. So only two non Newberry part guys are, are better than your fifth guy. That's crazy. And you're talking about these guys, Zach Ayers and Chris Cadillo of Davis and Clovis, two big time programs as well, too. Those guys are going to go on to be superstars as well, too. I want to give a shout out though before we go any further, because we're all going to focus on that first four. I want to give a shout out to five, six, and seven, because if five, six, and seven went to pretty much any other high school in the country, they'd be the biggest deal. There'd be pep rallies about them. <laughs> the school records would be just their name copied and pasted all over. But because they're on this team, they're not going to get talked about. So shout out uh, Daniel Appleford, the number five guy who finished seventh. Then you go down a whole two spots to find Hector Martinez, the sixth guy who got ninth. Didn't even count in the scoring. Hector Martinez, great job by you. And then in 26th, 26th in the state, Division one in California is pretty damn good. And that was our seventh guy, Dev Doshi, sophomore from Newberry Park. So how do, maybe I should have done research, but how did this come about? Because it seems kind of crazy for these four athletes and you could say five or six athletes because Ash Brenner, who went on to Colorado, and Nico Young, who went to NAU, were both very good two years ago in 2019. Um, how did one school get all these athletes so quick in such a short period of time? Do you know? That's a good. Yeah, no, I'm not. I don't know in terms of the, I mean, I'm guessing that. Someone probably Nico knows Yo- in the comments. Well, I'm guessing you have the Nico Young factor, which helps, and the Nico Young family. And if you're, if you're moving with, if you have twins and you get one, you have them both. You're multiplying your, your, your chances of, of winning. I mean, listen, there's, it's, it's high school, right? And people, um, want to run in successful programs. We saw like with Loudoun Valley a few years ago, remember? And, and people were flocking to Loudoun Valley and moving into the, into the district to, to run. So they were zoned in for, for Loudoun Valley. Um, but still. You got to get them there and then you have to have them run the race and you have to have them perform at this level. And then you're comparing them. We're not even comparing them to their, like their contemporaries. Like they could have run against the all-star team, Gordon, of like Newberry Park versus California history. And Newberry Park would have scored two, three, five, and 11, <laughs> right? Like now they would have, they would have had a little bit of a gap to their, to their fifth runner. Cause I don't know how far back they would have gone. But yeah, this is just, you know, forget all the, uh, how they got there, this collection of talent at any one time. And you can't say it's the shoes. This is cross country too. That's the other part. People want to jump to, oh, the, the times, the, the records mean nothing anymore. It's shoes. This is cross country. So we know that Colin Salmon is going to NAU, which is kind of incredible. The team is coming off of winning five in six years. Colin Salmon looks like someone who could potentially be an immediate scorer for NAU. I mean, if Nico Young was immediately top five, Colin Salmon like, is running better than what Nico Young did. Now, obviously, it doesn't always go to yeah. form of just because you run faster than someone in high school doesn't mean you're better than them in college or whatever. But if Nico Young and German Fernandez are like the baseline, those two guys were incredible their first year in college. And they have... Th- three guys here who are running like those two. Um, and one of them is a senior. So we're going to see him next year at NAU. Do you think Colin Salmon is going to become a immediate like expectation of top 20 individual, the way yeah. a Grant Fisher was the way Nico Young was the way any of the top, the number one recruits were in previous years. 
yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. I mean, there's no guarantee that it's going to happen, but I mean, the time speaks for itself. Now they might redshirt him, maybe. Maybe they'll strategize out the next couple of years and figure out the best way to utilize. And Nico's freshman year was weird because of the pandemic. It gave him more time yeah. to prep. Like, what's the alternate reality where Nico had to run that fall? Would he have run that fall? I'm not sure. Um, I mean, this is the greatest, greatest high school team ever. You're training. They the co- coach says they tr- only run sixty miles a week, so you think that there's room to improve. I read the story about how they train it. Uh, they've gone. They went to altitude and trained at, at Big Bear. But the fact that he's working out with guys this good, I think, would help his adjustment to running in college. That would be my assumption. Yeah, that's true, and I'm sure there's must be communication potentially between. Sean Bronson, the Newberry coach, and Mike Smith, and a U coach to like, hey, you gave me Nico in a in a good situation to get turn him into a, a even better situation as you know a college athlete. He's probably gonna be like, hey, do the same thing with Colin. I want like, mm-hmm. I want the transition to be perfect. You know, make sure he's has him fun as a high school kid, but we want to set him up to be able to dominate early on at NAU and. I mean, we, not to make this about any of you again, but like, there's a good chance Lex and Leo Young are also going to want to join their former teammate and current brother mm-hmm. at NAU. And then current you would think Aaron Solomon would want to join his c- former teammates and, you know, brother and Colin Solomon. Could there be a situation where you have potentially five Newberry Park guys on an NAU team at the same time? Like in 2023, 2024, like that would be insane. Like that doesn't happen. You see brothers go to schools, but you don't see an entire roster go to one school and that school being the best school in the nation. It's not like they're going to like a community college where it's like, hey, they'll take anybody. Like the odds of something like this happening where one high school is the exact same hub for one elite college. It's just mind boggling. Well, well, what it reminds me of, in a way, are some of those elite high school basketball programs, where by this the you know you see the showcase games and they have yeah. five seniors and they're all going D one and two of them are going to Kentucky setups like that. But we just haven't seen that in cross country for obvious reasons as much. I'm surprised. So this is you know undoubtedly the best boys team in high school history, cross country. We've gone this far, Gordon, without you posing the question or either offering up the question of how they would finish in D1 NCAAs. Because we have a little bit of info here. We have a little bit of data in terms of the markers in comparing them to German and comparing them to, to Nico, not to mention all those other historical um, runners that are on that list. But just that gives you a, at least a decent baseline of how good their first four could be, does it not? It does, but you also have to think how much did Nico and German improve, improve year over right. year from their senior high school to freshman year college because they had to have gotten better over that summer. They had to yeah. gotten better over the beginning of the fall before they ran their first true NCAA championship. So I don't know how much better they got. I mean, they they probably got, you know, 30% better maybe. Forty percent. It's a lot of better. I don't know what's the. In, how much does a coach make you better from year from fresh from senior year to freshman year? What's the? I mean, normally I, I don't know what the percentage is, but they. I mean, they're not going to finish top. They're not going to finish the way Nico Young finished at cross country. They're not going to finish right, like right. fifth, sixth, seventh. But yeah. you know, I don't. I could I don't argue. You could last, argue though. that. You could argue that one of them would be all American, and then the other. Or other three here, I could say Colin Solomon, All American, finished in the thirty to forty range, and then the Lex and Leo Young finish in the eighty range, and then Aaron Solomon a hundred, and then their fifth guy finishing in the two hundreds. I think that's fair. Put it that way. I don't know what that score would be. It would probably be a middle of the pack, like yeah, twenty fifth place team. 
potentially. I mean, if you had, I mean, look, it's so hard. Got, it's a 10K. There's all these things, but you know. Yeah. Well, you got four guys, or let's say three guys, running 1430 or, or faster on a cross country, 5K cross country course, right? You could say, okay, that's worth sub 14 on a track. I think we'd all agree. Fast track. And then you have that fourth guy who's a little bit farther back. If you had an NCAA team where you had that many guys, they're not winning the title, obviously, but they're competitive. People forget, I think, it's like, because we're looking at 1320s all the time. If you have a team with a bunch of 1350 guys, you can do pretty well. But it, it's, it, 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 that's putting aside moving up in distance, which is a big caveat as well, too. I'd, I, they wouldn't get last. I'm confident in saying that. They yes. would actually, I think they would, they would legitimately beat teams. Not get last. Which, yeah. yeah, which makes sense because this is the greatest team of all time. Of course they would beat teams a level up. Yeah, and it's not, I mean, yeah, it's like, you know, the, the freshman, like, in, like I'm sure Zion Williamson, his senior year, would have been able to yeah. dominate a lot of juniors and seniors at the college level because he was just so good. You know, we just have that situation here. There is an opportunity. I'm going to put this out there in the world. Today, I'm going to put it out in the world. We're going to have this take. Like, how would they have finished at the college? Why don't, we, why don't we have a little test run? There's a meet out there that does a fun little relay carnival known as the Penn Relays. Why don't we throw Salmon, Young, Young, and Salmon in a four by mile at the college level and see how they compete. They'll have more time to train. So they'll be deep into the spring of their, of their training cycle. So they'll come off this, this, this high of college of high school cross country. I think you could throw in the Newberry park high school boys of Young's and Solomon's. And I think they could be competitive at the pen relays four by mile. What do you think? Taking it a step further there, going down in distance. So you're not going up to the 10K, you're going down to the mile. If they're all running, what? What do we think? Between somewhere between four flat and four ten? I guess you're running some of that solo. You have to account for some some seconds there, because you get the baton and on that third leg, you're not gonna be running with people necessarily. Yeah, it's the depth for like, I think it's the fact because you yeah. You're 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 talking about Salmon be okay, this guy can be all American, everybody else, you know, maybe they're in the eighties. But Salmon beat Leo Young by two seconds and Lex Young by four seconds. So th- to me it's it's just the depth that's so impressive. It's not just one guy out there. It's it's these these the other two young brothers. Which by the way, you talked about the Youngs being the Ingebritsons, and we're like, which young is which Ingebritson? And the fact that Nico could be Henrik is terrifying. And it should be terrifying for everybody out there <laughs> in the United States. And it should be terrifying for everybody out there in the world. I still don't think that's the possibility. But if Nico turns out to be Henrik, because everybody always thinks the you know, old brother, older brother is, is good, but it's the younger brother that's going to be even better. And then the younger brother gets good at a younger age, but then tapers out. And we always take the older brother for granted because they, they got that extra little percent, right? When they were 20, they got they got better. They made that next little jump up. But then we're all fascinated with the 16 or 17 year old who's who's moving up and, and beating their PBs. But I think we have a real shot of this happening. And again, that is very frightening thought for everybody involved. Dunk it on Nico right there and, and Henrik at the same time. It's a, it's a weird, weird dunk. But they're both yeah, great. They're both great and their brothers could be better. That's the scary thing. I'm not saying it's going to yeah. happen. But I just and, and may, maybe there's no Jakob in this in this group. Maybe they're just like all degrees of Philip. Maybe that's the, the the comparison there. It's just it's wild because you see someone do something unprecedented, and then a couple of years later, two people in their family are right there. Yeah, but back to my four by mile potential Sorry, yes. simulation. Sorry. Colin Solomon is going to break four this year. He ran like four oh three or four oh four last year. He's going to break four as a senior. So they have one 359 guy. Yeah. And then yeah. the, young, the young brothers and Aaron Salmon, they've all run like 408, 409 as yeah. sophomores. Yeah. So you have to imagine they probably get up to the 405 range. So if they have three 405s and a 359, 358, like that's going to be enough 
to compete at, in a four by mile against the Georgetowns, the Villanovas. Like may, may, they won't win because you know Villanova, Georgetown will be able to throw in two guys who can run sub four, maybe even three. But they're yeah. gonna finish in the top eight. They're gonna finish maybe in the top five, which would be incredible to see an all high school team go to Penn Relays from across the country and and, and compete head to head with the best of the college teams. I think it would be incredible. I know they do a four by sixteen hundred sometimes over on the West Coast. But come over to East Coast, run a four by mile. I think that people would want to see that happen. To see, we're we're never going to see a team like this again. I mean, Newberry Park will still be good next year because they only lose one of these guys. But uh, it's kind of crazy that three of them are juniors and not they're not all seniors. If, uh, but if four other now that we have four, in, four, other... four is a perfect number for a relay. Let's throw them in a relay. Have the brothers hand off to each other. That's what I want to see. You didn't know that. You didn't know the Kipchoge twins are going there next year? You didn't hear about no, that? No, I did yet? not hear that. Uh, the high school record, four by mile boys, is 1647 by American Fork from 2017. Sounds like you think they have a shot at that. Oh, they can, they'll shatter that. I, I think they could run, on a good day, sub-1620. Like... Maybe even faster. Four by miles are always slower than you think they're going to be because you add up the times yeah. ahead of time and it never works. So I leave a little bit of a buffer. But if all of them went sub 410 last year, it's just funny to say. They all went sub 410 and then they came back for another year or another two years. I think 1620 could be possible. I would, you know, it's definitely 1630. The record's Don't. gone if they go for it. And I think at this point, you're just trying to go down in history. They've won NXNs. They've put together the greatest performances that high school cross country has ever seen as a team time and time and time again. What's next on the to-do list? I think this would be something that would be, would be fun. And you're right. Getting in there with the colleges would help pull them along. They should be able to because we always see these high school runners run Milrose or they run pre take a shot a relay yeah. team should have a shot as well too you see college runners go up and and challenge pro runners all the time that's a common thing in in track and field this should be it as well and it's it's not like they're going to be last they're, they're competitive yeah, and it's they also legit what, competitive. yeah what's unique about this year is like when nico young was the star it was all about nico right and yeah, seeing, yeah. throwing him in miller rose and seeing nico do nico things but this is like the first time like people want to see these four guys do something. They don't they're not just they don't want to see Colin just run fast or Leo or Alex just run fast or like a duo run fast. They don't want to see the four. Like after this race, it was about could they have the lowest team score? Could they have the lowest total team time? It wasn't about can Colin Solomon break German Fernandez's record. It was about can the team break the college the the, the high school state record. And yeah. I think this is a perfect opportunity for them to challenge the team in a cool relay situation because, let's be honest, them running a, any high school relay would be a snooze fest. It's like just watching them run by itself. But put them, yeah. It's more fun to watch Nico in the Millerose 3K or wherever he ran in the – was it a Millerose 3K? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then it would be to watch yeah. Nico run a solo run, right? So I want to see these four Newberry Park guys in a college four-by-mile as opposed to just a solo four by mile. Yeah, especially when it comes to team, because then you're out there for 16 laps, watching them yeah. just bury everybody, be more fun. Again, just historic performance for, for Newberry Park. Had to talk about it, had to open the show with it. But now I wanna switch gears, Gordon, and talk about capture the flag, because we got an old fashioned challenge going on in the sprint world. Uh, Marcel Jacobs, this is a great story. Lamont Marcel Jacobs, gold medalist in the 100 and the 4x1 for Italy, challenged Usain Bolt, that's right, the legend himself, Usain Bolt, to a capture the flag match. Now, this came after, I'm reading this article on France24.com, and they basically said, Bolt said that he would, would have won in Tokyo, 
and that got the attention of Jacobs. And the quote was, uh, you are my hero, so thanks for the hats off. But you also said you'd sure you'd win, so I'm up for the challenge. So then I'm thinking, okay, cool. He's about to challenge him to 100. But then the next sentence starts in a very unpredictable way. How about starting with a charity capture the flag? You bring your team and I'll bring mine. That's where we're at. So this got me thinking, what would be your ideal team that you'd have for capture the flag if you were representing America? To go up against the Italians and the Jamaicans. Like what would the USA team want to be for capture the flag? Because well, how big it's not just the four fastest guys. About. You got to have, what? there's got to be agility involved. You know, there's got to be yeah. some smarts. There got to be some shit talking involved. There's, it's more than yeah. just pure speed. How big of a field are we talking about? Like football field and then the halfway mark is, is so it's like 50-50, 50, 50, 50 yards on each side. Is that what we're yeah. doing? No, so we're talking, it's, it's old school capture the flag style. So it's in a neighborhood. It's in a cul-de-sac. Oh. So there's houses, to come, there's okay. trees, bushes to get around. There's objects to choose which way to go, way to hide. So we're talking about the size of a football field, but it's in a neighborhood. So there's streets, okay. lamp, lampposts, cars to hide around. So, Okay, so I'm night. thinking for my men's team, I'm thinking somebody who has a variety of different skills, is very adaptable but always comes out on top. So my first two picks, I'm going one current athlete and then one former athlete because we're talking Bolt here. So he's he's on the board too. But I'm going Grant Holloway and I'm going Ashton Eaton, my top two picks. That's good. I like that. Holloway is good because there might be a shrub you need to hurdle over while jump in over, route yeah. to kind of being chased, to jump over, you mm -hmm. know. He'll be able to be more direct with his um, his runs because he won't have to worry about the – the boulders in his Got way and eaton's football good football background I too. Like eaton. yeah football background eaton's yeah eaton's like an engineer or something now he just wants to go to space so he's going to come up with some crazy plan and he has the physical tools to to make it work i'm sure he's still in really good shape he can jump people jump over people go around people duck under people i i, I feel like I, he'd be solid in a cul-de-sac so i also think you might need an endurance athlete because Mm -hmm. Part of the strategy could be to tire them out by running in circles yeah. until the person is bored of protecting the flag and then they get tired and then you, that's when you, you, you pounce. So mm. I Safan would think Hassan at another event, her fourth event. Safan Hassan would be good. No, I was thinking oh, we would do an all-male team first and then all-female team. So okay. all -male team, I think okay. I would do Eric Sawinski. I think Eric Swinski won because he's willing to do anything. He'll be like, yes, I just finished three 800s. I'm ready to do this <laughs> he did the four by one. flag challenge. I've done the four by one. I'm willing to do this capture the flag versus Usain Bolt. I think Eric Swinski, and he has the endurance because he's the 800 meter guy, but he also has some speed. So I would yeah. go with Eric Swinski as the third guy. And then the fourth guy, you need someone who, who can kind of, who can like, Kind of jump, I feel. I think jumping might be important, right? Well, because you got to like eaten in Holloway, though. I think you need a true. burner. Okay, you need somebody who attracts attention, who could just goes on the outside and then brings a bunch of people over, and then Sawinski, Holloway, or Eaton like can go in and, and and get it. Like I think you just go pure top end at this point, and then you get a you get so you a, do Lyles. a a Coleman or Bromel or a Lyles. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. It, I mean, if you're talking 60 too, right? You're talking shorter. You probably do shorter stuff. Maybe a Baker. Yeah, you probably do a Lyles because Lyles would like do a dance and get this. He'll be more distracting, and a Coleman won't be distracting. He'll just be like he's a he's a man on a mission. Romel a yeah. little more distracting, but I think Lyles would be the most distracting with his hijinks. Flying star. So, yeah, too. I think Lyles, Lyles. Yeah. What'd you say? Flying start for Lyles would help him too. Like he's not going out from blocks, True. right? He's because you know, capture flag, you're sort of playing that little dance game, right? You're trying to trick people. Hey, am I going over to going back? You got two or three people over here drawing a bit of attention. Lyles gets a, a 15 yard run up into enemy territory and he's gone. Yes. He's pulling everybody over that way. Then, meanwhile, we reroute Sawinski, who just got off a plane from Italy where he ran three 800s. <laughs> 
goes in, gets the flag, and then we win. Yeah, so I like this. I like a Holloway, um, Sawinski, Lyles, and Eaton. I think that's a great, great four to go up against Bolt's team and um, it, it, the Italians. But they'll probably throw in their high oh. jumper, so they'll probably put the, the flag up in a tree and he'll be able to jump up and get it. So that might yeah. Be but Before we go to the women's. Jump, so that's good. Yeah. Before we go to the women's team, let, let's make a pause, take a pause here for a second. I, I feel like you didn't make enough fun of the fact that I'd read this sentence, which was, and I, and I quote, how about starting with the charity capture the flag? You bring your team and I'll bring mine. Do you feel like the fastest man in the world right now should have been a little bit more, I don't know, not, not confrontational, but it should, should he have pushed back a little, little harder and not immediately gone to let's play capture the flag. Let's play a kid's game. Like, I mean, it is, it is. I don't bold. know. What do you, it's bold. So he's not going to get too mad at bold. Did bolt ever say this too? I don't remember bolt saying this. I don't know. I feel like no. I would have Bolt won. knows he wouldn't have won. He's out of shape. He's like, yeah. well, yeah. I mean, I think the argument that Bolt can always have is like, me at my best is better than anyone has ever existed. So I could always right. say, if I was at my best, I would have won because yeah, he that's true because he is the best. So, but he's not frozen. Bolt at his time. best we is always going to be the best. You know, we don't get the benefit of 09 Bolt. You you if you want to talk about who would have won in 2021, you got to take. We were in 2021. I just thought it was interesting that he went to charity capture the flag right away. Maybe he owns, does he own like some sort of company that does charity capture the flag? And why charity event? capture the flag? Yeah, why if not? Doesn't the charity up capture the flag? <laughs> for profit capture the flag. Why is there not more for profit capture the flag? <laughs> right? All right, women's team. I think um, he did the charity to kind of guilt him. That was the guilt. Yeah. Like, oh, you can't say no to charity. So that means you have to do the capture the flag. That's why I threw in the charity. There's a whole thing where people are just waiting for Bolt to say something about them because that's their big moment. That's their big opportunity. And like, how do you want to play yeah. it? Do you want to push back real hard and challenge him to a race and get Dan Patrick involved? Like what happened with Tyreek Hill? Do you want to spin it to a charity thing? But you only have really one shot at this. Because I think after the first time, Bolt is just going to get bored with you and he's going to move on to the next person who challenges him. So Marcel Jacobs had a card to play and he used it for charity capture the flag. Listen, <laughs> if it gets, if it, if the end result is we get a charity capture the flag game, okay, it's better than nothing. But it's also, Bolt might just laugh at this. They're like, what do I want to, why would I want to play capture the flag? This is silly. Also, I didn't know Capture the Flag was like an international game. I didn't know Italians knew about Capture the Flag. I thought it was just an American thing. Well, okay. So in the in the bottom of this article, on and this is an uh, article on France 24. I don't know if it was an, initially from Italy, but it says Capture the Flag or, and I'm saying a Ruba Bandiera, as it's known in Italy, is a schoolyard game played by children in which two teams race to capture the other team's flag, located the team's base, and bring it safely back to their own base. All right, let's do the women's team. I feel pretty strongly about a couple picks. One, I'm going Shelly and Fraser Price. Explosion, quick speed, can get it and turn and go. And also, if you know, you you there's an elements where you have to free the people from the base too, right? And you be able, you got to be able to get out of there and and go. So I like her. The endurance thing got me thinking. And versatility. I think a thing Mo has to be involved in this team in some form or fashion. Yeah, a thing Mo. More than Safan Hassan, because a thing Mo has speed. Because even though endurance is important, you still need some speed because if they can get you in 20 meters, it's over. Who cares if you can keep running? So I think, yeah, yeah. a thing Mo. I mean, I'm going to say it. You know, I'm going to say it. We're, you, you, need, you need distractions, you need ways to. Mess with the opponent. Mm. You need Shakari mm -hmm. in there. Yeah. Right. You need yeah. Shakari Richardson to like Mic come up with the game plan. Mic her up. Mic her up. <laughs> yeah. Mic her up. <laughs> this to, to talk shit to try to get that flag. So, and then, so we got Shakari, Shelly Ann, a thing Mo. Kind of, you need Do more. You, get... you need like an agility person. Oh, I got an idea. You, Lamar Rojas, Ooh. she just jumps the whole way. 
it's hard to tag her when she's jumping over you. Yeah, you can do that. I like I like that. fifteen I like meters. That fifteen meters, she can triple jump. That that gets you pretty far in that field. Do you think there'll be any value to have like a shot putter or like a like a hammer thrower type person or javelin? Would that would be any value javelin? in that? Well, are you allowed to throw the flag? No, no, you have to possess it all the way across. Okay. Okay. Because if I was just javelin, getting to that. someone get in there and throw the flag on the other side, boom, well, done. It's it's funny you mentioned shot put because I was right about to mention who do you think would have the best spin move in track and field? Which event group would be able to – because spinning I think is important because especially yeah. if you're cornered by two people, there's a limited amount of moves you have. If you're in the open field, you try to jump over somebody, that's not going to work. You try to run past them, that's not going to work. A spin move is, is one of your go-to moves. Now, which event group would have the best spin move? Well, shot putters who spin – they spin for a living. There's very few people out there who actually spin for a living. Even NFL running backs, they don't spend as much time spinning <laughs> as shot putters who spin. Right? Discus runner, discus yeah, throwers go round and round. Well, yes. But, but like what is sprinter they will be have flaws. No, a shot putter will have flaws with being able, with obviously with speed, but this could just be about a short-term close. need. Yeah, just a short-term need. We need to get this flag from point A to point B because – Basically, what happens is when you get caught with the flag, the new flag base becomes wherever you got caught. So you just use it to get the flag out of an inconvenient spot. Use a shot putter, sacrifice mm-hmm. the shot putter to get the flag to a more a spot that's more visible for than the other three to get. So I think maybe we do bring in a shot putter. Yeah. I think Maggie Ewan, she's kind of cross shot put, hammer throw, discus. Mm-hmm. Throw in Maggie Ewan, and she will be our sacrificial lamb to get the flag into a more easily accessible spot. I'd go, I'd go thrower before I would go distance runner if you're going 1,500 meters and up because there's, they're more explosive. That, that 10, 20 sure. meter burst, that's going to go the way of the, the shot putter. And I, I, I'm still hung up on the spin thing, Gordon. I really think spinning is important, and I don't think we give enough credit to the best spinners in the world. And those are, those are track and field athletes, throwers in particular, who can get out there and try to spin around the competition. You just said an interesting rule that I have never used when I played, which is you move the base to wherever the flag went. We always put it back in that same corner if you got caught. Oh, no. That must be the, base that's moves. the Pennsylvania rules. Okay. Yes. So you're, you're, just playing, you're playing PA style. That's called PA style, capture the flag for those out there. Not Ruba Banderia. Was- How do you say that? I'm mispronouncing that. I remember I took capture the flag too seriously one year, and it was it was it was bad. The problem with capture the flag is there's always a few who take it too seriously, and yeah, and it becomes a, it becomes a little too intense, you know. <laughs> Dude, like one of my times. only physical one of the only physical altercations of my entire life happened in capture the flag. You're 100 percent right. Some guy pushed <laughs> me down to the ground because he didn't like how. How aggressively I was, I was, I was pursuing him. Uh, Patrick in the chat asks, what did I tune into? We're talking about capture the flag teams in track and field. We're putting together our best one because Lamont Marcel Jacobs challenged Usain Bolt to charity capture the flag for whatever reason. But now, with the remaining 13 minutes, we can talk about the Manchester run, a.k.a. the latest addition in Wayne Kalati completely destroys a field because that's what she did. She won by a minute, broke the course record. I don't have anything left to say about Wayne Kalati, Gordon. Like it's it's like the same story every single time. How do we get more excited about random road races? Because like at the end of the day, it's tough. What like it's like why did? Especially random road races that are that aren't in season, you know. It's just kind of sometimes it makes sense when you're like looking at like a track 10k because you can look at the time. They could use that time to kind of project where it's going to be when it comes down to a national championship or a world championship. But random road races at unique mile distances, 
it's like, are we just watching glorified practice right now? Like, is that what we're watching? Okay. But what I also wonder is with the money involved, why aren't more pros running it and why are not more pros running it seriously? Because you look at some of these time bonuses that they get and the Manchester run had a king of the mountain, queen of the mountain thing, where if they were leading at the top of the hill, they got an additional bonus as well too. Now, again, it's not a million dollars or anything like that, but look at some of the prize purses in track and field. It, st- it stacks up really well. And I just don't know why we're not seeing more people run it or take it more seriously. I mean, this was 4.7 miles. That's in the wheelhouse with a lot of, a lot of different runners. Yeah. No, I know it's, like, it's obviously it's over Thanksgiving and it's, you know, it's not. The most yeah, un- she, she gets the course. Okay. So she got a, according to David Monty, she got 10,000 in prize money and, and bonuses for this one race. You got to figure there was an appearance fee as well too. Like that's a really good, that's a really good payday. What a di- what a diamond league winners get. Like 10 for now she broke the course record and that's part of, bonus there too but you gotta think there's other runners that that could have thrown their hat in the ring it's just interesting when you look at the from the financial side for why aren't runners more runners doing it because i think that answers your first question which is how why would we or how can we care more about it it's if it's wayne Kalati plus krisha schweizer plus elise cranny plus rachel snyder you know that whole that it's like basically that cast of characters that you see vying for Olympic spots is out there competing in these road races. I think that's where we would care more. Yeah. Like I remember when Molly Huddle was going on her, her crazy like streak where every road race she entered, she would win and started yeah. like becoming, it just became boring in a way. Cause it's like, I'm watching Molly Huddle beat like people that she's clearly better than. I'm just mm-hmm. watching a glorified practice. And I feel like maybe Wayne Kalati might become the new Molly Hoddle of the roads where she's going to be able to just dominate every distance on the USATF road circuit and be like, I am the 4.8 mile champion. I am the 8K champion. I'm the 12K champion. I'm the 26.1 champion. Yeah. It'd be different from the full marathon, whatever. Uh, But you know what I mean? So, but yeah. yeah. It's like, it's interesting because the people who run these races, you always think, okay, they're, they're a tweener. They want to do stuff longer than the 10 K, but they're not quite to the marathon. Even if the distances are shorter, even if the distances are are five miles, but they also want to race a bunch and they're willing to travel a bunch. So they're like, what, what sort of athletes fit best in, in these circumstances we saw, when was it two years ago when Chess was running a bunch of these? And winning a bunch of these as well too now he had different circumstances right because he was still trying to figure out where who he was going to compete for where he was going to compete but it just it seems like a few people take him really seriously and those people do really well and then the other people drop in and drop out and they use it as a training exercise basically so you have a bunch of people going hey this is my super bowl and then a bunch of other people using it as preseason to get ready for a track or a road race, a longer road race. Yeah. I want to see her run. Like I, because Kalati keeps winning by such big margins. So I want to see her in bigger and bigger events, more and more marquee races. Like I can't wait for track season to see, you know, cause I, she's not going to just be a road person her whole life. Like she's going to run five and five and 10 again, just like she did at the trials. I want to, I want to see that. I'm excited. We will get to see uh, Connor Mance run at the half marathon U.S. champs fresh off his NCAA victory this weekend. Connor Mance could be, I mean, we always talk about w- when will a college kid go right to the roads, skip the whole track thing, become a, a legit marathoner from day one. Yeah. And we look at Connor Mance as a potential guy for that. And, you know, you know, we have a bunch of college kids running at the BU uh, indoor season opener mm-hmm. this weekend, live on Flow Track to run some fast 5K qualifiers for NCAA indoors. Connor Mance obviously not doing NCAAs, so him 
trying to take his NCA cross country fitness into a half marathon. That's going to be something interesting to, to follow. And, you know, mm. everyone always talks, you know, Ryan Hall, American record. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I do think Connor, Connor Mance being young, being strong, being fit. That's the type of person you need to go after a Ryan Hall type American record of breaking 60. He's got the speed. He has that. And he's young enough. I also think Mance is going to go Rhodes. There's already obvious clues. He, he tried to run the marathon trials. We know that already. And that was when he was in college. And, you know, like Jared Ward ran, ran the Chicago Marathon before NCAA cross when he was at, at BYU. So he is a little bit of a special case just because he, we've already seen his intentions and he's a little older too and he's got a ton of experience, has always liked the longer stuff. So I don't know if he's going to set the trend. I think he's going to do it, but I don't know if other people are going to follow because I think enough people will be like, man, he's just, he's just a different breed, right? Like he's just a, a special athlete. In, in a unique set of circumstances. All right. Well, I think that's it. Wrap it up. Like, yeah. subscribe, the podcast. We'll talk about um, BU season opener, maybe Wednesday or Friday. Talk about running lane cross-country championships with Newberry Park. But it's good to be back on our regular scheduled podcast Monday, mm -hmm. Wednesday, Friday. Should be good. Anything else? No, that's all. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Gordon and I are going on a, a super secret special trip tomorrow, which we might have details about later on in the week. Hint. There we go. World indoors. We're going. Just kidding. <laughs> Talk to you guys Wednesday. See ya.